think, I don't know, sometimes I'm looking in the life of Christ when Jesus, uh, he's, he's the master teacher, he's the disciple maker. They are to follow him and, and, and be an example of him. And Jesus is teaching, but guess what? This disciple seems like they're not getting it. And sometimes it can be what becomes what? Frustrating. When you need to become a disciple and God turning into you, turning you into a disciple. If you are a parent, you will understand what I am saying. Anthony, have you been teaching your daughter and telling her to do this thing over about 20 times? You're saying, this is all you need to do it. And at times, church, the minister, Angus, we can become what? Frustrated because you're teaching your kid to do the right thing. You're a parent. And they just seem like they can't, they're not getting it. And sometimes you are going to become frustrated. I, this has happened to me many times. I guess this is where some form of patience and also some form of long suffering has to kick in. So you have to have this, the fruit of the spirit to become a disciple maker. You have to, you must exercise the fruit of the spirit. Because tolerance, Jesus was, he was a person who was patient and he had this tolerance where he, he was so patient with his disciples um, that he stood before them and he washed their feet. And so um, this is one of the things that we're going to be praying about. Uh, you know, we have to be patient with people. I am very patient with individuals, but sometimes there's a time when I said, I got to leave you behind because I don't want you to pull me under. If you understand what I'm saying. Um, I, I've had people who have backslidden now, gone back in the world, and I've been so patient to them with them. When I see they're not making a move, I have to move forward with somebody else. But these, all of this takes prayer, and it takes understanding, and that is why we got to trust and follow whom? Jesus Christ. As I said, this is a guide. It is not replaced in the Bible. There are scriptures in it. Um, <clears throat> first, the preface. And you can write your name in it. It is yours. Um, I don't know if, if you carry a particular um, church, those who are female, carry a particular handbag, you can put it in it. If so you don't forget when you are coming um, here on a Sunday, you don't forget it. But we are going to be going through this. So first we want to look on the preface. You know, a lot of times when we get a book, we go straight into the topics. Well, we want to go into the preface, some um, introduction, and I'll, I'll read. The material that you will find, everybody there, preface, the first, the, the, the page nine. Go to page nine. Everybody in there? Alright? The material that you will find in the book is designed to introduce newcomers to the core teachings of the faith and provide meaningful conversation for mature disciples. It is intended to teach a gospel message that is, com that is so compelling and biblical that, is, that it leads to discipleship. We believe the gospel we preach and the Jesus and the Jesus we present determines the kind of disciple, disciple a person becomes. Thus, the goal of this material is to establish authentic disciples whose minds are informed, hearts are inflamed, and hands are activated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is for you to process in a smaller relational setting. The reality of God's kingdom calls us to invite people into a relation into a relational yet countercultural mindset based on the truth of Jesus, the inspiration and the authority of the Bible, the holiness and love of God, the importance of repentance, confession, and baptism in conversion, the call to a faithful faith, and discipleship in the local church. We want people to become disciples or grow stronger as disciples with a, a rock-solid conviction. 
with rock solid conviction. In each chapter, we will look at what God desires every day, disciples to learn and relearn, so that we can truly trust and follow Jesus today and follow him in a joyful submission rather than a, a cave in to the cultural to the culture around us. There are three three key things to remember as you embark on a plan to grow over to go sorry over this material with others. Life on one life and on life. We cannot state strongly enough that the goal is to cover this material in a life-on-life -life context, as opposed to solely an educational one. The format is designed for open, honest uh, sharing together. Please set the example each time for others by sharing your personal reflection. Invite one another into your lives out outside the group. Pray for each other. Text each other and talk often. We want to follow and be like Jesus who invite those he was willing, he was discipling into a relationship with him that encompassed all of life. Does anybody understand what um, one is saying, the life on life? You understand that life on life paragraph? So, just as how Jesus, when he chose his 12 disciples, you realize that he was always what? With them. So, he was teaching them and he was what? Praying with them. He was doing a ministry what? With them. Now, we understand the dynamics of the culture here, the modern days, that we are not going around in a group setting as um, with 12 persons we have we are live we live in our different homes but what we can do what we can do is communicate and be concerned about each other or especially the person the group that we are going to be discipling so if you don't I hope you understand that we are intentionally targeting Groups are people. It can be people in our homes. It can be our family members. It can be um, someone who is um, uh, our neighbor. But we have to be, to be um, disciple makers, we have to be intentional. Like I, I have some persons in my life that I target, I check up on, I make sure, I, I am making sure or I am triggering them to look to God, to to, 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 to look to God to be the life uh, teacher of their lives and examples of their lives. Uh, I, I target them so that they can start to uh, worship God more often. So this life on life is that you are not going to be 24-7 um, uh, in terms of hours together physically but you can be 24-7 um, together um, spiritually by praying for the person, by texting the person, huh? by helping each other to be aware of whom? Of who we are and of Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm saying? Huh? Mm -hmm. So it's like you are holding each other accountable holding each other accountable. It's not that you are pushing them, but you're just holding each other account accountable or letting each other be better aware of what we want to achieve. Because Christianity, we're in a community, and Christianity is not an event. Christianity is a way of life. Okay? It is a way of life. Okay? So I must be concerned with each other, um, um, concerned for each other. So my mom, she calls me every day. <laughs> every single day my mom calls me. I kid you not. <coughs> yeah. And um, 
If she does not call me one day, I will know. I will know, and then I'm like, what's wrong with mom? Why she didn't call me? Because I am used to her what? Calling me every day. Mom, she, mom, a mother is a very nurturing, caring person. They have this nurturing and caring. They love their children. And, and so the, there's this connection. And, I, and even sometimes I feel frustrated. I say, mom, why are you calling me every day? And I stop saying that. Because one day, I don't know how I might die before her, but if she dies, I'm going to long for that one. That call. You understand what I'm saying? So it is also of our nurturing, caring sense of a motherly love. She keeps calling her son, checking up on her son, talking to her son. Right? And so this caring and sharing in terms of making a disciple. This is the kind of nurturing kind of stuff I want God to instill in us. This spiritual nurturing and caring um, for whoever you are targeting. Whoever you are targeting. Okay? So the life and life, as I said, we can do it through text messages. We can do it through a phone call. Who are you going to target? Do you see some people that... You know, you feel like you can make disciples of them. Okay? Don't be scared. Don't think that you're going to, you're crying. Brother McIntosh, what are some of the the, the, the skills or the, what do you call things you need to know? I don't know if they still do that course in J Jamaica School of Preaching and Biblical Studies. But when we are going on evangelism, how do we break the ice? You remember that? Um, In terms of meeting somebody who is new for the first time. There are different ways to do that. Uh, but you, one of the effective ways is that you strike a familiar ground. Uh, striking a familiar ground means that, for example, if I go to your house and I see that you, you like plants, then I compliment that plant. Yes. You know, to say that I like that plant. Right. It's nice, you know. Yes. Um, if I see that you're just freshly painted the house. Yes. Or oh, I like the painting of this house. Yeah. Like, well, you get what I'm saying? Yes. So you strike out. What do you yes. Do on you? Yes. Something parallel with what they are doing. Yeah. You're showing this appreciation. You strike up a conversation. It could be you and the person could um, have the same taste in fabric or the type of color clothing, you know, and you strike up that conversation. And by the time you know it, um, who are you, Where, what are you doing? That's what they're asking. They, they realize that you have some parallel, some things that are common with you and your liking. And, 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 and so they start to ask you the question, who are you, why are you here? I've never seen you before. And then you, you just slide into it and you start to tell them, well, you know, I'm, I'm such and such a person. I am a, a, a disciple of Christ and I'm meeting people and getting to know them and hopefully I'll be able to share something. And so further down, you, you start to introduce what you are about. You know, so don't think it is hard. Sometimes you do it and you don't even know. Um, at the grocery shop, at the grocery store, wherever you go, at a particular gas station that you, you pump your gas, or, or at the doctor, the, when you go to the doctor's office, or, you know, at um, uh, your, your, your child's teacher at school, and wherever you go, you can um, um, sl uh, get, introduce yourself by, by paralleling with what they are teaching, um, the type of work that they are doing, you find some common ground to introduce or to strike up a conversation. Now the next one is meet weekly. Keep it small and gender based. So we recommend that you meet weekly in a relationship. That's, that's two. In a rela relational place such as a coffee shop or in whom Ideally, you will start with two to four other people of the same gender 
in your meeting, you might want to start by getting to know um, one another's background, perhaps by completing a spiritual biography exercise like the one described in the book, the Disciple Maker Handbook, before you jump into this, stu in this study. Um, this part of first getting to know each other will help you start with a strong relational, relational tone. Seek to keep the number of meetings on the material to eight, which is vitally important in church context where people will be reviewing this material annually. So what is this say? We have a, you are retired. Sister Billy, you are retired, right? But I guess your grandchild might keep you busy. And Sister Agnes, you are retired. And, and, and for those who are not retired, this is doable. This is doable. And so you, who you know you can meet and, and, and try to make a disciple of weekly. Who you know you can, you know, a couple, you can start with a couple persons. Um, you know, I know people they have this every week they meet twice, they have this coffee kind of break. I don't know our coffee meeting and they talk and they sing and whatever works for you. It can be on a farm. I know you guys don't farm, but it can be on a farm. Um, but what works? Um, you know, there are other persons who are retired where you can, you know, meet them where they are at in their home and, and visit them and, and just strike up a conversation and introduction and over a simple little meal or bites or sandwiches or tea or whatever it may be. And, and you introduce God to them, start to turn them into a disciple. This is what you're about. It is doable, church, it is doable. Um, I, have my, I have my devotionals with people online and also personal. Uh, and so when you want to draw strength from others, I say, listen, I call up somebody and I say, pray for me. I, ha I need to have this conversation. But we need to do this in a physical setting. Can we do this? We need to do this in a physical setting because this is the way how we are going to make what? Disciples. So, Anthony... I know you are very busy, um, but it can start two times a week. Who can we target? Who are the persons we can target? They may not be in this neighborhood, or maybe your neighborhood. Who are, who are the male persons we can target? Who are the females? The females are going to target females, the males are going to target males. Um, males. All right? So review the questions and read the chapters before each meeting. The format of, of the study is for people to read the material before the meeting so that you can discuss your answer to the questions if you do not read the material before you meet. Plan on at least an hour and a half for, you, for your meeting time and consider keeping the group to five people or fewer, including the leaders. Okay, so that's what Dr. Bobby um, Arrington said. It may be different, can you gotta tweak it a little bit, etc. Am I making sense here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> so chapter one, God. Chapter 1, God. Let's start the conversation with a story from the Bible. The story takes place around uh, 50 AD in ancient Athens. It's about the Apostle Paul, an early church leader. And it is recorded in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, verse 16 through to 31. 
while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of uh, Epicureans and Stokic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this Babylon trying to say? Others remarked, it seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said to this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, and where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing in some strange ideas to our ears. And we would like to know what that means. All the Athenians and the foreigner, foreigners and who live there spend their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the leaders, the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the upper Apocalypse, um, Apocalypse thanks, and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are religious, for as I walk around and look carefully at your objects of worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. You are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands, and, he's, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everything life and bread and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have on our being, as some of you own, own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, or image made by human design and skills. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And the man who he has appointed, you will know that is Jesus Christ. So, the question is, what is your gut reaction to this story? Huh? What is your re reaction, reaction to what Paul here is saying? What are some of the things that jumps out at you? How does it feel to know that God made you in the, in the hope that you would personally seek him out as described below? God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him, for him, and find him, um, though he is not far away from far, you. Far away from you. What steps would you need to take to seek God, to reach out for him and find him at a deeper level? The, 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 the element of this lesson, um, I think, well, there's, in 2000, several years ago, the JSP made us memorize this whole passage mm -hmm. um, for valuation purposes. Um, I remember it's faded somewhat, but I still know the passage. Mm -hmm. And I think what came out of it from that time until now is that in order for them to draw close to that they first have to know the truth. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main thing that jumps across is that from verse 17, when when um, he went there and saw that their city was given over to idols, and he reasoned in the marketplace with them so. Verse 30 says, 
these kind of ignorance fall over you. You are he's basically saying to him that hey, listen, you are ignorant and not afraid to draw to so that and become a disciple. You have to learn the truth, this is what I'm teaching it to you. But if afterward when he says, you know, um, you know, God has given assurance of us of Jesus, um, of eternal life through Jesus by raising him from the dead. The Bible continues to say that when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, you have some persons mock while others say you will hear you again on this matter, but then you had some that believed. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, what he went there to do was achieve, even though not all persons did. Some persons mock, the others said we will hear again on this matter, while someone believed because discipleship at the time would have been for you to know the truth. Okay. So, looking, um, as we look on the ancient world behind the text, our awareness of God, verse, um, I'm sorry, um, page 13, when the Apostle Paul talked to the people in Athens, he assumed a perspective about God. It is something that I have found to be true today. People intuitively and subconsciously know that God exists. I know that may sound naive and unreasonable to some, especially to proclaim atheists who claim there is no God. But I have found that often, after years of careful investigation and personal, personal experience, even when studying with atheists in a graduate philosophy department, it is true. Everyone intuitively senses that God exists. Why are there atheists? People have been trained to think of life as if there is no God. Or, pro or, or people often simply dislike religion and reject, reject the gods that they don't, they know about or hear about from others. Or others frankly don't think about God because they want to be their own God. But I find that most people will affirm in the right circumstances that an higher power is out there. This lines up with what the Bible teaches, that our consciousness of the created world itself somehow tells us God exists. This morning, Ian and I were traveling to Pangburn. What did you say, Ian? Mm -hmm. What did you say to me when you were traveling and viewing the trees? And, and the, 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 the different colors of the trees and the trees shedding their leaves in the winter. Oh, they said some of these trees. Um, what did you say pertaining to God? Oh, yes. He look at all of these things and, and still say God is not real. Yes, that's exactly what he said. That people look at the beauty of the world and the creative mass um, um, artistry of the world and the landscape as we travel coming in into Pangburn. He was able to make that statement and said, how can people, when they look at how God has carpeted the world with all kinds of different trees and beautiful trees and animals and rivers, and said, there is no God. That's what he said. And he didn't know what I was going to talk about. Yeah? So watch this now. Consider a verse from the book of Romans in the Bible. Romans 1, chapter 1, and verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible quality, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So this verse not only tells us that God exists, but also that every Everyone knows about God's eternal power and divine nature. This discussion guide doesn't have the space to dive into the arguments for God's existence. Though that it is a beneficial endeavor. See, and you can go and see Appendix 1 for a short summary of the three classic arguments. Instead, we will operate under the assumptions that you, the reader, the believer in God, but also that you may need help determining 
if the God revealed by Jesus is the true God and creator of the world. Or maybe you just need help trusting and following Jesus. Our approach starting in the next chapter will be, will be to start with the historical reliability of Jesus. We will see that there is a solid basis to believe that the gospel give us an accurate portrait, portrait of Jesus from history. That perspective then becomes the foundation upon which we can show what Jesus teaches us about God in the gospel. We will see that there is good reason to believe that the gospel writings in the Bible accurately record, record his words. And so, um, based on what I have presented from the book, is that even atheists believe in something. Even the atheists believe in something. Because it takes faith to believe in an evolution, <laughs> in a Big Bang theory. Are you with me? It takes faith to believe in that um, the Darwin, the Darwin uh, uh, philosophy. You know what Darwin said, right? He came from monkey. I don't know if he got that, but that's what he said. <laughs> but it takes great faith because um, I've never seen an orange tree bearing a uh, pine or a uh, melon. Mm -mm. Orange is a citrus fruit and it is going to go down the line of its citrus nature. Right? Um, you have different types of mangoes. They're going to go down the line of their um, DNA. Right? So I see monkey reproducing monkey and human being reproducing human being. Never seen a monkey reproducing. You understand what I'm saying? So for Darwin to believe that and atheists to believe that, it takes great faith. It takes great faith. And, but the world described to us that God is and he is powerful and he is in the creative order if you look good enough and look good in nature. If there's a light, there must be a light maker. If there's a shoe, there is a shoe maker. And if there are creatures, there must be what? A creator, God, that designed this world superior to us. And then I can go down into the history and the study of anthropology. Anthropology is the study of man. That man has always, human beings, has always seek to worship something or someone it is within human's DNA to look to something that is iron. When the Tainas and the Native Americans and, and, and other people of, of, of um, tribes, when they found them, they, 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 they realized they either worship the moon, the sun, or some image. It is within man's DNA to look to something to what? To worship. So there, man knows that there is a creator. And so for us to find this, it is now we who are going to carry this to people. Uh, carry the, us, carry the message to the world. So first, we got to develop our own trust and believe in God as a disciple maker. And then we are going to look to Jesus for the example to see how he, made, he makes what? Disciples. So this is a practical, a practical uh, teaching. It is a, it is a practical uh, way of life. This book is get, uh, is going to aid us to become practical, and we have to physically identify the people who we are going to be in the group with. It doesn't have to be four. It can be two persons, three persons. Um, how, how we're going to help them to turn them into what? Disciple making. And this has to be, this has to be intentional. So first, I am the leader. I am, I have started already. Okay? And I have to devote my life. Um, yeah, there are people who need help. These 12 men who Jesus, um, on as disciples, they needed Jesus knew that they needed what help, 
And so that is why he took them on. And he helped them. You know, you know, not every one of them are going to be saved, but you first have to go into it and try to help make disciples of people. And so females, St. Agnes, um, yes, you're going to make disciples. You have to target the females in your life, whoever you want to target. Um, Sister Millie, you have to be a disciple. Maybe you target who you want to talk, become deliberate. It can be one family member, two family members. You pray with them. You, you become a part of their life. If you want these books, we have books around here. You can collect them and you go through the, the book with them. And you start, we start to become the site of what makes. Anthony, same thing for you, um, for myself. And, you know, we have to start somewhere. Is that hard? It's so hard. <laughs> You're not talking back to me. Yeah, identify the person. So, you know, there are some names that I am going to write down and I'm going to pray over their name and I am going to call them and I am going to try and meet with them. On campus, I'm going to um, make some disciples with um, persons there so I can be physically, you know, yeah, grouping, praying, and, and meeting um, together. So I first have to be a disciple maker. So I'm going to lead by example. All right. So um, we're going to go through this book, but understand that this is a practical thing. We are doing this. It's a practical. We are not just going to read and that's it and we go. It's a practical thing. We have to identify some people that we are going to engage and pray with on a weekly basis, and and and, and we are going to become accountable to our and whatever and as I said we are not going to go in force in and said we are making disciples no we, 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 we are going to be friends we're going to talk and, and, and gradually gradually you, you see where this transpires I turn into any questions any comment all right thank you for your time we will break and we will continue this uh, next week.